Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on the physicians and practitioners who are redefining medicine through their integrative, functional, and holistic approach to health and well-being. I'm pleased to welcome two anti-aging medicine clinical leaders, Dr. Barbie Barrett and Dr. Andrew Giroux. So for both of you, what first attracted you both to A4M? And how do you integrate anti-aging approaches to medicine into your respective practices? Some 20 years ago, we came to a conference. We didn't know anything about integrative or anti-aging medicine. It was almost a mistake. We went to our first lecture here, and the speakers were phenomenal. These were uh, Harvard trained, Cambridge trained. I mean, these people were phenomenal. What they told me, what they told us, was something we hadn't heard before. We were used to mainstream concepts. We were mainstream physicians and the A4M integrative medicine approach made a lot of sense. And then we started looking at the information, the data, the studies, which verified that many of the teachings uh, from A4M, from integrative medicine, are valid, not only valid, but should be followed by ourselves and with our patients. Being an ER physician, it's really kind of sad. We, we get what we call in the emergency colloquialism, retreads, the same patient coming back to the ER week after week or month with the same problems. And you know we're very good about fixing things, but we weren't doing any preemptive or prophylactic care. And I thought, how can I, how can I best serve these poor patients who keep coming in with the same problem? I can't sleep, or I can't lose weight, or I, I feel like kicking the cat when I get home, or it, it was very frustrating. We weren't solving their problems. You know, we'd, give them uh, a sedative and send them, pat them on their head and send them home or get some blood tests and say everything was fine. But we really didn't really get into the essence of the patient. And, and what they taught me here was to you know, look at the patient as a whole entity rather than, oh, you're here for your broken ankle. Oh, but by the way, you're currently having a divorce. You've lost your job. You're suicidal. It was very frustrating. So this, this taught me that I can you know, treat the patient as, as a whole entity and look at all sides of the spectrum and really taught me what sides of that sphere to look at. And it's really very, very rewarding um, when you see your patients get better and not become retreads. There seems to be a shift in understanding towards integrated medicine as well as aesthetic medicine into holistic health. As a health practitioner, board certified in an emergency medicine as well as aesthetic medicine, can you share your views on this relationship? I like the aesthetic component. Um, it's, there's been so much new in that, that arena. Um, I became involved with injectables and laser therapy. And, and, and you, know, you can talk about vanity, but the bottom line is we're a very youth-oriented society. And if you want to stay alive and well in that youth-oriented society, you better darn well look healthy and reasonably attractive. Everybody likes to look at attractive things. And, you know, it's, it's sad how many people want just the aesthetics, but if I can combine the two by treating from the inside as well as the outside, I can produce a healthy, happier, sexier you. And, and uh, A4M has taught me how to do that, how to integrate uh, beauty as well as, as internal beauty, that one, one day could have to go hand in hand. And often patients will say, well, you know, they worry about the vanity concept, but it's called keeping your job. Uh, you know, Botox has added another seven years to a uh, male's life and 11 years to a female's life as far as job longevity. And um, this, this really, you know, it, it's, it's talk, talking about survival and, and it's hard to survive in this youth-oriented youth society. And this, this allows us to stay active because we, you, when you have a bad hair day or you look in the mirror and things don't, you kind of go out of the house feeling bad. So if I can combine this internal health with the external appearance, Everybody thanks me. It's, it's a very rewarding specialty. You know, am I doing neurosurgery and saving somebody's brain? Yes. I'm doing it, though, with alternative methods, okay? And I'm not using the traditional scalpel. So if you look good, you feel good. There you go. <laughs> so, Dr. Giroux, uh, tomorrow you'll actually be leading a presentation on the HPA axis dysfunction. Can you share an overview of this presentation? I think this is a good example of what A4M has done for us and for the medical community. So the HPA axis, which is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, that's a big word, um, we have brought that to the forefront for the practitioner and the patient starting some 20 years ago, talking about how this, the adrenal function is so important to life 
and how life itself needs to be modified in terms of relaxation techniques and stress. Um, and now it's something that is recognized and treatable uh, with the interrelationship of the physician to the patient. And this is a perfect example of the teaching that we get and the ability to implement these teachings and help our patients and help ourselves. Excellent. And for those that may not know what the HPA entails, could you give us a little bit of well, education on that? Yeah, hypothalamic pituitary axis. So it's the whole structure from the base of the brain to the adrenal function itself. So it's the interplay of the hormones, and there are 50 plus uh, major ones from the adrenals that affect everything we do from sex hormones to stress hormones. Um, and that's what the practice and that's what the lecture is about. And why is understanding this topic so important when considering overall wellness? It's the basis for our health. It's the main hormonal basis that directs everything that we do. Um, without the HP axis functioning properly, uh, we, we couldn't live. So, and we can modify those things. We can actually affect them in a relatively simple way as long as we're aware of it. And for Dr. Duro, can you give us an overview of your presentation delivered earlier today on female sexual dysfunction? The overview is basically that it's very difficult for many patients to speak with their doctors regarding sexual events or concerns. Um, when I ask you if you have allergies or prior surgeries, you can spit those answers out, great, okay, no problem. But if I start to get into more, if you will, delicate subjects, certainly with the older generation, it's very difficult for them. The younger ones tend to be a little more forthcoming, but then you've got to learn their lingo. It's a different language. So I went through the Urban Dictionary and kind of reviewed that with uh, our listeners so they could speak with their young patients. Also, it's very difficult for many doctors to talk to their patients about sex, to ask questions like, how many times do you masturbate? Um, how often have you faked orgasm? These are tough questions, but these are the, at the root of many of the sexual desire disorders. And unless you go through these with your patients in a non-judgmental way, which A4M has taught me how to do, then it becomes very difficult for doctor-patient relation. And so it, it's really, really um, made life a lot easier for my patients as well as myself. Uh, people don't realize that sexual wellness is just as important as exercise and diet and only about 7% of the population answered, you know, that they realized, you know, it's very important to have good sexual health. So you mentioned UrbanDictionary.com, so I thought that was pretty funny. How has the treatment of sexual uh, dysfunction evolved over the years? We now have patient specifics. I can give you a specific peptide, neuropeptide to take, which will increase sexual desire. Uh, and it's not, no longer just for the men. We have alternatives for the female. We have female pelvic vasodilators, we have female neuropeptides that work on the brain. We can now offer something to our females. Um, we have some female Viagra, if you will, and these are FDA approved things. So it, it's really nice that we have something to offer our males, and their biggest problem tends to be erectile dysfunction, whereas the females, it's more desire. I'm too tired, I've got to take care of the kids. And, and so I can offer concrete pharmacological, nutritional therapies, which is really nice because it's very important to have a healthy sex life as important as good diet and exercise. I believe it. Now, Dr. Drew, you have the incredibly unique experience of being both a healthcare practitioner as well as a police officer. Can you share on how you balance these two roles? When I was in initial training as an intern, I was at Los Angeles County Hospital and I became a Los Angeles County Deputy Sheriff. And that, that continued throughout my career. So I have 30 plus years in law enforcement uh, when I moved up to Northern California. So I just recently retired, but I finished off with Daly City and with our SWAT team the last seven years of my, of my work, and I was a full-time officer. Now, I was able to do that because I had partners who were understanding. So I could work shifts that were two or three days a week, and it complied with full-time status. And to my way of thinking, it's all the same. I want to help people. Um, in medicine, I feel strongly that integrated medicine helps people, keeps them healthy. And as a police officer, it's the same thing. If you have a proper attitude, you're helping people. They need help and you're there for them. So it was an easy, it was not a problem with the transition. Just curious, which uh, profession did you choose first? Uh, well, it was almost time. Well, I went to medical school first and then to law enforcement. So I'd say on that basis, but it was almost the same time in training. Very cool. Well, thank you uh, both. You both have really interesting stories. And of course, uh, I was blown away when I heard not only that you're an emergency um, 
physician, but you also do aesthetic medicine. And then Dr. Jarreau, that you're doing, or you were a police officer as well as a physician. So it's really cool to have two dynamic uh, leaders within A4M. So thank you for spending some time with us today.